The best science tells us, I think, that we have a window, but a small window and a window that is closing rapidly on us, okay? And so it is to the question of how we're going to jump through that window that I now turn. And it is here that we begin to see some hopeful things, I think. We begin to see some of the conditions forming that might allow us to act with some of the speed and nimbleness that we need to. In the first place, public opinion is changing very quickly on this issue, very quickly. Hurricane Katrina blew open the door. Al Gore came through it with his movie. A lot of other things have happened that are really beginning to tell. There was a Gallup poll released yesterday. Twice as many Americans now say climate change is a serious problem as they did a year ago. 78% of Americans think that each American should be spending, as the question put it, several thousand dollars to make their homes more energy efficient, okay, in case you're wondering if there's any kind of business opportunity here. 69% um, <laughs> of Americans think that we should only be using compact fluorescent light bulbs in our house. 44% of Americans think that we should ban vehicles that get less than 30 miles to the gallon which given the, <laughs> given the state of America's automotive fleet means that a very large percentage of Americans think the vehicles they are driving should be banned, okay? 46% um, think that there should be a surcharge on utility bills when energy use exceeds some certain limit. I haven't seen the trend lines in this particular poll, but I would wager that those numbers in every one of those questions have tripled in the course of the last year. That you wouldn't have found 70% of Americans saying ban incandescent light bulbs, you know, a year ago. So far, I think, and rightly so, business is viewed rel as a relatively benign part of this process, okay? Reputation, uh, uh, the, the anger hasn't been at the business world so far, and partly that's because of the things that are, people are starting to do, which I'll get back to in a minute, and partly, it's maybe even mostly, it's because the political system has been so dysfunctional on this issue that it's allowed everybody else to look relatively good by comparison, okay? <laughs> Washington has seen a 20-year bipartisan effort to accomplish nothing, and it has been highly successful, and it's only been getting worse in recent years. The so-called National Energy Plan that the Vice President put together in the first year of the current administration will go down in history as one of the most short-sighted jokes in the history of policy making. It foresees, well, Every chemist and physicist in the world is saying you've got to cut carbon while every other developed nation in the world is trying to figure out how to do it. That plan foresees 25, 30 percent increases in carbon dioxide production in this country in the next generation. The administration last week, or two weeks ago, issued a report saying, yep, our CO2 emissions have been increasing 1 percent a year and that's going to continue at least through 2020 as far as we can tell. The chair of the relevant committee, co committee in the Senate until last November, until January, was a man who, I mean, the, the person that the rest of official Washington chose, right, to run the committee, the relevant committee to deal with this, was a person who believed that global warming was a hoax, and when he had a committee, when he had a hearing on this, the main witness he summoned was the novelist Michael Crichton to explain <laughs> what was going on. Some of that remains in place. I testified in Congress last week um, um, on these issues, and some of it was inspiring and some of it was incredibly depressing to still have congressmen. A congressman said, I have here a copy of Newsweek from 1976, and there's a scientist there that said that there was going to be an ice age, so how would we know who to believe? You know, the sort of level of, of almost willful ignorance on these issues is amazing in our nation's capital. It is the last place in the world that still manages to convince itself or some large part of itself that the laws of physics and chemistry somehow are as malleable as the tax code, you know, and, and can be bent in whatever way. 
As a result of all this, okay, the, the beginning but still quite modest policies of most of corporate America have been roundly applauded because next to that they look very, very good indeed. Another result of that complete paralysis in Washington has been, and this is a very good result too, has been the explosion of state and local initiatives around the country. We've done, learned an awful lot with that sort of, with, with no outlet in Washington, that pressure for change has sort of fired off in a thousand different places. And along the way, we've learned an awful lot of lessons that will pay off in coming decades about what works, what we can do, where the options are, all of that. But now, now it has to go to Washington. And it has to go to Washington quickly. And it has to go to Washington for two reasons. One, Washington is the only place central enough that we can begin the work of repricing energy, okay, which is at the bottom what's going to have to happen if we're going to see change of the scale we need in the time we need. Okay? It can't, in the end, even California probably isn't big enough on its own to really change the price signals that are getting sent into this most central of markets. Two, and maybe in the end, even more important, only Washington can leverage the international involvement that we also need. Okay? The greatest single mistake that we've made environmentally in the last six years hasn't been our own complete you know, un unwillingness to do anything. It's been the fact that we've walked away from all international discussion of these issues. And only when we begin now to do something credible from the center is there any hope of getting back into those most crucial of discussions in some way that stands a chance of making a difference. And this is where it's going to be extremely important, both these areas, for business to really begin to step up what's going on. So far, as I say, the progress made in corporate America has been salutary and good. I think it's come for a number of reasons. One, by definition, business people are smart enough to realize and set up to realize the enormous savings possible when you use energy efficiently. Okay? And that's really been the, the single most significant thing. I think that people have managed to surprise everyone in the companies that have really taken this on with their ability to rapidly reduce energy use and have it go straight to the bottom line. Two, companies are, you know, that have multinational exposure are increasingly understanding what the future holds and have been for six or seven years getting the strong signals from Europe and Japan from those publics that the kind of things that so far have been tolerated here won't be tolerated internationally for very much longer. And third, of course, by now, there's the strong desire for some kind of certainty for the sense of what the deal is going to be that we cut and that guides us going forward. So that's where business is now. And let me tell you, before I go into sort of what I think that deal needs to look like, let me tell you where sort of civil society is now. The environmental movement has morphed very much into the climate change movement in the last two or three years. That's where attention is being focused, and not only in the traditional environmental movement, but from a wide variety of other actors. The faith community chief among them, which in the last two years has really finally taken this issue on as a key cornerstone of its work, both in conservative and in liberal faith communities. Let me give you just one example, and it's this one that, that Mindy referred to earlier of this work that I've been doing in the course of this 